Hi everyone, I'm Avery Willis Hoffman, Program Director at the Park Avenue Armory. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm joining you all from Brewster, New York, the occupied and unceded homeland of the Wappingers, the Muncie-speaking Delawares. I am a mixed race woman with brownish golden short curly hair. I'm wearing red lipstick today and a red top with colorful flowers and a turquoise necklace. I am actually sitting in my car in the sun uh, near a lake surrounded by trees with occasional cars going by. Thank you so much, Josie, for that beautiful welcome song entitled Deep Snow. All of our conversations, as those of you who have been tuning in will know, are framed by our acknowledgement of the native stewards of the lands on which we presently live. We pray respect to all their ancestors, as well as present and future generations. We acknowledge that many indigenous people continue to live and work on these lands, and we honor their ongoing contributions to our world. On behalf of Park Avenue Armory and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, I'm so pleased to welcome you all to our 100 Years 100 Women conversation series. This is the fourth episode, I think, or maybe the fifth, I think it's the fourth, in our series and is meant to be a casual lunchtime, at least on the East Coast, a gathering of artists and participants to discuss pressing topics and issues. We've heard so many wonderful speakers so far in the series, um, and this is part of the 100 Years 100 Women project, uh, which Aisha will tell us a little bit about in a minute. Um, so please feel free to grab a beverage, uh, food, and participate in the YouTube chat. Post your questions there throughout the conversation. Thank you so much to Gloria and to Kristen for the ASL interpretation today. So I will turn it over to Aisha Williams, our, our host uh, today from our partner, The Laundromat Project, uh, for a few words of welcome and then on to the conversation. Enjoy. Thank you, Avery, for that uh, wonderful introduction and a huge thank you to you and Darian and your whole team over at Park Avenue Armory for giving us this space for this conversation, um, as well as a big shout out to the team over at the Met. Um, my name is Aisha Williams. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a deputy director at the Laundromat Project, one of the partner organizations of the 100 Years 100 Women uh, series. I am a medium or darker brown complected uh, black woman. I have a long ponytail with my hair slicked down. I am sitting in a room that has bright colorful pillows behind me and a gray sofa. And I am calling in from Bedstuy, Brooklyn, uh, which uh, is uh, on the occupied and unceded lands of the Canarse, who are part of the Monsi Lenape. I recognize them as the original stewards of this land and pay respects to their elders past, present, and future. I also invite you to join me in acknowledging the histories of the land where you are currently gathered and pay respect and gratitude to its original stewards. And I also want to extend a thank you to our ASL interpreters, Gloria and Kristen, and also want to use this opportunity to kick it off and welcome 
of my co-hosts, co-conspirators in this conversation, um, brilliant artists and creators uh, to introduce themselves and then we'll get started and, and jump into a, a really full and generative conversation. So Risha, I see you first on my screen. So I will throw it to you for introducing yourself. We can, oh, I think we lost her. So Gail, I'll, I'll, I'll pull you, I'll bring you in. You're next on my screen. Sure. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gail Fiquette, and uh, I'm talking to you from Los Angeles, California, where I uh, pay tribute and acknowledge the Tongva lands, elders, and histories. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, I consider myself a movement maker, instigator, uh, choreographer by other um, definitions. I am the uh, exiting director of a dance program at CSU Pomona, Department of Theater and New Dance. I'm looking forward to a new New York journey. And um, yes, today I have my fully zhuzhed red hair, totally combed out. I'm wearing a vintage brown and tan um, shirt with some floral patternings, uh, Afrotectopia shirt uh, technology. And uh, I am sitting in a glorious loft with a disco ball, some hanging dice, and just an excellent, fabulous uh, community of co-conspirators to share and enjoy and continue our um, leanings and creativities. So thank you to all of you and thank you to uh, everyone in the organization and a hundred women, a hundred years. Wow, what an honor. Um, I will pass it on to Catherine. Thanks, Gail. <laughs> Your red hair is giving me life this morning <laughs> in New York, as well as the red lipstick. It's looking beautiful. Um, so my name is Catherine Tuchy. I came on to 100 Years, 100 Women um, as a commissioned artist by the Laundromat Project. And so I, I know Aisha, I've met her before. Um, and I'm meeting all these other fabulous women for the first time through this panel. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm the daughter of Coptic Egyptian immigrants, and I made my way to Flatbush, Brooklyn, which is the unceded territory of the Lenape Munsi. Um, and I acknowledge that and I'm trying to learn as much as I can about that daily. Um, I'm a visual artist. I work in mixed media, uh, mostly in some painting and animation. And previous to COVID, I was also an art educator. Um, I hope I didn't forget anything. Did I forget anything? No. Okay. <laughs> so I'm I'm gonna pass it to my this way, my right, which is Andrea. Hello, everyone. Good morning. It's such an honor to be here today. My name is Andrea Jennings. I my I prefer the pronouns she and her. I am an actress, a speaker. I'm just an all-around creator. I'm consider myself kind of like an artivist. I'm the vice chair of the city of Pasadena's Accessibility and Disability Commission. I also own a production company called Shifting Creative Paradigms that focuses on creating inclusive content. I'm calling in from Pasadena, California, which is the indigenous land of the Tonga people, I hope I pronounced that right. And I also want to, you know, pay respect to the original people. I, I'm also sitting in front of a purple background. I'm a black woman with curly kind of reddish brownish hair. And I'm wearing a black top or a black dress. And again, I just want to acknowledge 100 women 
100 years. This has been an absolute amazing journey. We did something last year. It's an honor to be with everyone here. And I hope I didn't forget anything. And we'll pass it to Arisha. Hi everyone, my name is Risha Rocks. My pronouns are she and her. Uh, I'm the child of an East Indian Jamaican immigrant, my mother, and I am the child of a Black American father. I'm on the same land as the land of my father and his father. So I'm coming to you from a neighborhood known as the Jungles in Los Angeles, technically named Baldwin Village. And I am giving deep, deep honor and respect. I'm on the territory of the Tongva people, specifically the smaller village of the Sangna. I am a deeply melanated black woman. I have my head wrapped. I'm wearing sea themed jewelry, pearls, aquamarine. I'm sitting on a bright yellow wing chair in front of my wall of art in my beautiful, happy, cozy home. Um, also, I'm here as a commissioned artist by the National Black Theater as a part of the 100 Years 100 Women Project, which has just continued to give and give more and more gifts and opportunities and experiences and balm for this time. Thank you for that. Aisha, I wanted to also say to my New York sisters, I was originally born in New York. <laughs> So I'm actually a native New Yorker. We feel your energy here. <laughs> we feel you, I'm feeling that. And I'm also like totally vibing off of that California glow behind Risha and your chair. So <laughs> all of the connectedness, we continue these connected uh, weavings of, of just, yes, all the things. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just jump us into this conversation. And again, y'all casual, I have my coffee here. I'm on my third cup. Um, it was an early morning. So in, uh, we had a chance to connect with one another. So I'm imagining we won't get through all the questions and I could keep asking more and more questions. Um, so I am sure uh, uh, that it'll be a full discussion. And just for folks who are joining us, there will be some time for Q&A um, again. So if there's not a question that we get to, uh, there'll be opportunity and space to ask as well. And so everyone shared just kind of, um, brief inklings about how we're all connected uh, to one another uh, just in this physical form right now, squares on a Zoom uh, screen, but the 100 Years 100 Women project uh, was created or developed by in partnership with the Park Avenue Armory and National Black Theater. Um, and as I was going through, digging through all my notes and remembering because you know, the past 14 months, what, what, what it has done to us. Um, I look back and I saw that we originally convened as a part of a uh, symposium at the Park Avenue Armory in February of 2020. Came together, had a conversation, a discussion about the complex legacy of the 19th Amendment and celebrating 100 years after its ratification. And so as originally conceived, it was gonna be the symposium, then we were gonna come back together and do full blown out commissions in the drill hall. And it was gonna be so amazing and COVID uh, and all the many things that COVID brought. And so a big shout out to Park Avenue Armory, Avery really pulled us together and, and really championed the fact that this was a very vital conversation that needed to happen um, and continue and folks needed to be engaged in art could be a leader in talking about this really complex subject matter and topic and how it impacts all of us collectively. And so um, continued on with the commissioning idea. Uh, and again, here we're represented by National Black Theater, Park Avenue Armory, the Laundromat Project, Urban Bush Women. I think I've caught all of the commissioning partners. Uh, we are four of 11 total. Um, and came together and created digital uh, iterations of your commission ideas reflecting on this idea of uh, 100 years of suffrage. And so um, there was a presentation over the summer, a very beautiful hour long virtual gathering where I think that was one of the first times where all of the commission artists had a chance to see one another's work um, and be able to reflect 
uh, uh, on one another's work um, and be inspired. It was truly a beautiful moment um, in such a really heavy, heavy time. It was really inspiring and actually kept me, propelled me um, through the rest of the year. Um, and then that happened. And then again, because power and women move things um, truly. And so uh, coming together again to think through what continued conversations could be and, and creating forums for continued discussion. And so that has turned into where we're at right now uh, with these lunchtime series uh, conversations. And so today's lunchtime, I think I caught everything. Y'all tell me if I missed anything. It's a, a long timeline. Um, but uh, our conversation today is about freedom and liberation. And so I'll read uh, uh, directly the description of our conversation or where we should be centering or where we will be centering today, uh, which is in a period of lockdowns and complete cancellation of work, artists have struggled to gain access to studios, maintain creative practices and steady income streams. Striving towards personal and professional liberation feels perhaps the hardest challenge of all. And so I'll jump us off in conversation and whoever wants to hop in first, uh, what I would love to ask of you all are just given everything that's happened, um, whether it's over the course of this project, over the course of this year, what are some of the biggest changes or challenges that have occurred in regards to your creative practice? Well, I'll jump in, I'll jump in. I am, a disabled black woman. So I, there's, I, I have several identities that intersect. And so basically being a person with a disability, I'm used to, I was used to kind of being shut in only because of accessible issues. And so at first it felt like, uh, okay, well, I'm used to this. As a creative, I felt stifled, but then I thought, wait, I'm a creative. So let me, <laughs> Let me pivot out of this. This is probably an, a really good time to create. And so that's what I did. I just started to think of what can I write? I wrote a lot of poetry stemming from how I felt as a black woman in that experience. And I just started to just be in it. But as a creative, it did affect me in one way, I would say, but then again, it also helped me to grow, helped me to go with deep within. Okay, I'll go next. Um, ever since this topic came and bubbled up, you know, I was really trying to decide uh, the lens and the frame. And I was uh, sharing with the group the other day, this idea that the, the liberation and freedom is becoming one and the same for me. And um, it really was such an important uh, generator in this time of crisis, really, um, the opportunity to uh, have a, a chance to present a work uh, with the Park Armory and really lean into, you know, what does that mean for me personally? And the idea of power and privilege and women and our histories. Um, I was deeply motivated and moved and was very uh, surprised in that it allowed me primarily as a movement maker, um, installation person to, um, as um, Andrea was suggesting, you know, driving into other areas, you know, really taking out that, that camera again and really going into multimedia and creating environments, tactile set design, um, spaces, environments to find freedom and to liberate myself um, in this project. And I do feel like it is really fantastic because it's a it's an ongoing. And when you think about like the scope of it and all the artists and all the um, uh, entities and universes that sponsored and, and, and promoted this collective action, um, I'm still in it, actually. <laughs> I'm finding out that I, I, I never turned it off. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm so super grateful for that because um, it was such a wonderful opportunity and a huge one and a life-changing one and um, set, set the bar for me in a way and reminded me that it is really important to keep going and growing and creating and, uh, multiple self and identity and tasks. So, um, Yes, I really uh, appreciate those those two words as metaphors, you know, and, and kickstarters for this discussion. 
And Catherine, Risha, what are some of the, the yeah. I'll, yes, I'll go. Um, I have a very personal answer because, you know, as an artist, I never felt like a lot of artists talk about creating out of pain. I never felt that way. I've always tried my hardest to create healthy space in my life so that I can create because I basically always felt like I could only create when I was healthy and happy. And what happened during this pandemic that for me in my personal life, the endless train of death, which interestingly has nothing to do with COVID, it's just what's always with us along with being taken deeply, deeply internal, um, living amongst my family in a small bubble. I have a child and I have a mother and I'm so blessed to have this multi-generational woman family, but also it's, it's tough and it's rough. And then personal issues in my life, personal issues in my artistic and creative life and really feeling like I could just almost give up. I don't have the focus. I don't have the energy. I'm sad. I'm scared. There's all this stuff going on. And you know, this project, and I'm sure that it's not just me. So I give so much honor and respect that, you know, Avery, I find you amazing that you guys kept going and made this happen because it had a huge impact on my life. And I do feel the most that I've learned in terms of freeing myself is that I found my artistic center. And now I create out of anything. It doesn't matter what's going on. I'm still creating. And I feel like I have a place of solace deep, deep inside. And I don't know that I would have found that without this, what the whole planet going through something at once to me is so deep because no matter how huge something is, whether it's a tsunami, an earthquake, I live in LA, whether it's um, something having to do with war or local issues, the murders, the unending train of murders of Black people in America, unreckoned, because my work for this project was about Breonna Taylor, who I consider her murder still unreckoned. And things like that would have, I just almost would feel helpless before. And now I just feel really grateful that I found a place, a voice to create and to continue to, basically I move as a free person within, but to find a way to act upon my environment and make something outside of myself. Uh, yeah, I'm just taking in what everyone's saying. Um, so I, I just wanna add also that I forgot to mention my physical description. So I will quickly mention that now. I'm a very light brown skinned woman. I have dark curly hair that is loose. I'm wearing little gold hoops and a black tank top and I'm sitting in my bedroom, which doubles as my studio. And there's like a blue thing behind me. <laughs> that's part of an artwork that's hanging there. It kind of looks like a continent or something, but um, okay. So how, you know, what are the challenges? Um, I, I relate to what Risha brought up, which was that it was a really uh, internal time which can be good for art making actually. So throughout the pandemic, I was, I was making art, but it was like just as a, a self-sustaining activity. And I really uh, became very politically disillusioned with the art world and arts institutions. Although I was happy to be part of this project, you know, the critical side of my brain was was highly activated, <laughs> um, you know, and it's it just wasn't, wasn't within the arts community that that was happening. It, it's just politically in general. I mean, we just come on. We just came out of four years of 45. Let's not forget that trauma as well. So there was just so much going on politically. There has been so much going on politically forever. <laughs> um, and that was all jumbled in and it sort of like uh, manifested to the very, very micro personal level during this time. So there was a lot of reflection happening in terms of my actual art process. I, ha I was lucky to have a residency in, in Brooklyn before the lockdown. And so I had a studio space where I was making like fairly large works that went hung on the wall. Um, and of course I didn't have access to the studio or I think, I think they said that we could still go in there but people were freaked out. Like we weren't leaving our homes. So my bedroom became my studio. I was working much smaller, um, really exploring 
sets of interconnected figures, I was thinking and reflecting very deeply on the idea of interconnection because that was something I was sensing in a very like tender kind of way. Um, and previous to that, I had always worked with single, very layered figures. So it was manifesting in the forms that I was trying to create. But alongside all this like inner reflection and kind of like sacredness of the, the art practice that was continuing, you know, as much as it could. Uh, like I said, I was also becoming more radicalized, I think, and really craving um, organizing with my peers, with other artists, uh, building a, a political voice among artists. And I have more to say about that, but that's, I'll just cap it at that for now. And thank you, thank you everybody. And actually that's a, I'm gonna do a little bit of a pivot, Catherine, just on that, on that point. Um, and I'm curious, uh, you all have had an opportunity to be in community with one another as a part of this project. And I hope you might share a little bit about what you might have learned from either one another's projects or even conversations that you've had with one another um, that might be sitting with you right now and thinking about how you know your work might shift or your thinking might shift. I think about our conversation before um, about this idea of art and activism um, and the intersection of those two as a point of um, uh, inspiration for lack of a better word at the moment, but I think it is inspiration, probably a more, more poignant word that I could use. But I'm curious, just being in community with one another, what that has meant to your own individual advancement, whether it's as, an, as a creator, as an artist, you can even go so far as to say as a person, because I think they all kind of converge obviously into one another at some point in time. Um, you are all those things at once. So yes, how have you inspired one another? <laughs> I'd like to speak to that because mm -hmm. it's actually a real deep question that I've been dealing with. Um, and it really relates to the original topic of 100 years, 100 women and that when I was first presented with this opportunity, I was thinking suffrage, voting rights, disenfranchisement, I feel disenfranchised right now, you know, and, and I'm a privileged person. I'm also a black person person. I'm also a woman person. I'm also a large body person. There's so many, I'm also just a different person because we're all different. And I want to actually just take a quick moment to say so much appreciation to the ASL interpreters because it's just, we could go on forever being inclusive and being more authentic about the fact that every single human here is unique and different. And we, in order to live as a society, I guess thus far, we have to act like that's not the case, but it is the case. Like there's no, none of these lines or boundaries really are accurate when it comes down to the individual. So on the one hand, I'm feeling like I tend to move as a disenfranchised person. And there are ways that there's something honest about that, but it's also not liberating because there's also a layer where that's not true. So what I found through this is that I'm looking at this project like, wow, here I am doing this thing. I'm not, I'm an emerging artist. I'm not super institutionalized. I'm somewhat institutionalized. I went to college and I got an MFA, so I am. But when I realized the personal connections I make in these spaces and how intrigued and awed I am by the women that I've worked with, the art that I saw during the event, I was really blown away. I didn't know how much I needed that event until it happened. It was absolutely incredible. A lot of you were in, were directly in that opening event. That was my introduction to you. I think you're incredible. Having the pre-talk for this and getting a little more of you guys and researching your organizations, like I'm just really blown away. And so now I'm trying to ride a line where I do not go to the point of um, disenfranchisement. I acknowledge it, but I don't allow it to be a force that halts my own liberation and the liberation of others. Because I also realize while we're able to come together, and yes, I do have questions about how it can become more open, more inclusive, particularly in an art space, because how are we gonna make world-changing art if only the privileged are getting platforms and access to, to engage the entire public, you know? It's a real question for me, but also I'm realizing the beautiful part about it is that 
I am making connections with people, in this case, women, I am just so overwhelmed and impressed and I'm grateful. And gratitude is like, I don't know, it makes me feel less disenfranchised. Yeah, I can jump in too. I mean, this idea of being disenfranchised and wanting to uh, flip, uh, acknowledge, but flip that. And um, when I was working on my project, I had a, a sort of a sub theme um, buried within about manifesting heaven. And I've been thinking about that in terms of, you know, what does it mean like now, today, and as we've all sort of gone through, right, this, uh, this time and uh, effort and experience together and uh, kind of riffing back on what I said just a minute ago, like the project's not over for me. And it's making me kind of go in kind of little concentric rings of the different narratives and the stories on a personal, on a political, um, uh, just a little wrap around. Uh, I was loosely um, uh, locking into the uh, Underground Railroad, but then in a particular, because um, uh, I grew up in Canada and I didn't know that much about it. And I uh, was really uh, engaged and um, um, leaning in hard on these untold stories, uh, you know, across the Canadian border, right? And uh, closely up, uh, you know, mostly um, Ohio, I was kind of uh, zooming in on that idea. And then this idea that as you manifest heaven, um, which was uh, an acronym for Canada, right? And the North Star and freedom and liberation and all of these things. And it, it's just like kind of so coming uh, full circle for me now. Um, I so appreciated, I, I uh, appreciated the variety of artists that were commissioned and brought in. Um, if anything, I've always felt as a movement maker, somewhat uh, siloed or that movement maker that's not just a movement maker, you know, again, you know, the dance person, the theater person, and, and these, these crazy labels and definitions that I think um, have restricted me in the past. And uh, so enjoying this idea of when I saw all of you and all these other incredible artists from different disciplines and cross disciplines that were um, invited in, it got me really, really excited. Uh, it really made me think about the importance of like community building and, you know, manifesting more heavens. Um, it made me think back, um, my um, sponsoring organization is Urban Bushwoman. And, you know, I've grown up in that family, in that, that weave of just having specific core values about women and people and acknowledgement um, of uh, particularly, you know, black and brown bodies and, um, our untold story. So uh, I just feel so grateful. You know, so many things are like bubbling and simmering and I feel like I'm in the kitchen with all the, all the ranges on, you know, and this one's bubbling and on the low and this one's just almost caught fire and, you know, oh my gosh, all these different things that um, the potentiality for that. And um, again, I'm super excited that, you know, I, um, until we started talking that I realized the project's not over. You know, and it, it just has so much um, elasticity and capacity and like, where can it grow and go and hopefully not all alone anymore. Yeah. I love that, Gail. Um, just the fact that I think I discovered, like you said, the multidisciplinary, the inter interdisciplinary. I, I remember Risha's project. I remember the colors just, amazing. When we did the project, it was so amazing um, because I was around a lot of my commissioners and we were told that we couldn't meet in person and we had to figure out, okay, how are we going to use our voices? Mm -hmm. I sent them the program that we were a part of and I sent it to my friends and my family. Remember, we were in the middle of this pandemic, this strange new, like what's going on? And it's so funny because Americans, they don't, sometimes they don't want to value artists with as far as funding. And some people complain about prices to events. And, but in this time when we were alone, art, in my opinion, it just like you were saying, Gail, like the heavens, it kind of was an extension of the heavens. It was like, 
it saved us in a way. It caused us to, to really bring us together and connect us. And that's something that as I lie on the intersection of being an artivist, as I call it, I know these terms, but someone who is an artist, I love music, I have a master's in music. And, but yet I use my position as a community advocate to, to advise, but I use, use, use my voice, I use art. And in that moment, I sent an invitation for the commissioners and to, for people that I know that's in the, the advocacy realm to watch it. And they were touched. I got so, so, I got such amazing feedback. I mean, they were literally touched. They were kind of scared before this was a calming for them. And I'm hoping that when we walk away from our experience from the pandemic and being quarantined, that we do not forget about how important the arts are, how important the artists are. How are, how are they making a living? How are they making it from day to day? But not so much that, but just to support art. Yeah, and I think, um, I, I do feel like it's on us to remind the, the wider public continually because people do have a tendency to forget. And if they don't practice art and they're not trying to do it as their profession, they may not be familiar with um, what that even looks like or feels like. So, I mean, I think what I also learned from participating in this project is um, definitely what you're saying about it being like sort of a kind of heaven. I mean, I love that uh, way of speaking about it because even in those, you know, with all the cynicism and all the things I was going through, then actually experiencing um, the event the day that it launched. And it was, it was like, like an explosion of creativity and voice and heart and pain and just all the things that we were all going through through creativity and through creative form. So it, it's when we get together and when we all use our creative voices in whatever discipline that we, disciplines that we work in, it's, it's extremely powerful. Um, I wish that these walls between like different mediums would dissolve a little bit more. And I wish that we would have more opportunities to bring so, so many people together um, so many people that don't typically get the spotlight. I think what was also powerful about this event was the way that it was curated was broken down by um, bringing in POC led organizations within the city that aren't the biggest nonprofits or museums out there. That's a strategic move that I think is important and that should continue. And also, um, you know, this mix of like emerging artists. I also am, I'm not a big fish in New York City, you know, <laughs> so I'm not associated with any institution either. Although I do have a BFA, so, and I went to college. So, and I have privilege, you know, all those things, but there's all these layers and in New York, you know, it's like all the stars come here. So having this mix of really emerging people with a master like Carrie Mae Weems, it actually works really well. Like it's just, powerful it doesn't matter how many degrees you have what matters is your work and your voice so um i hope things like that can can continue and i think also we just we need platforms like as artists we need platforms you know we need to make our work but then we also need to be able to talk and convene and strategize and have a say in institutions consult you know with people who are at the top say what our needs are, have a list of demands, you know, just really get it out there because people will, I think there's a lot of other pressing issues in the world. <laughs> people aren't necessarily thinking about artists' rights, you know. You know? Catherine, I love what you're saying about the platforms because it's making me think too, um, you know, other ways of busting the model of what's a platform, right? And, um, mm -hmm. Again, dance theater, we've always thought about the stage, right? Or uh, then it's either the museum or, okay, something site-driven. Um, but I'm thinking it would be really interesting if there could be more active involvements in supporting artists to reinvent or create access 
to new platforms, you know, and I don't even know what I mean by that exactly, but um, uh, this time has made us all be so fluid and uh, a need to be inventive and creative. And, you know, sometimes I'm laughing. It's like, I don't really want to go back into a theater. Like, do I have to? And uh, I'm joking, of course. But, you know, it's like it's kind of exciting, these ideas of like, um, what's a platform? In my neighborhood, I live in a building where we staged uh, kind of an interactive, which is neighbors, really, but super creative folk, um, on our balconies, in a parking lot, like where we live. Like, that's a new platform, right? So bomb and like ways to not always think, of course, you know, some other places are more you strive or you want to, oh, if my work could get seen there or whatever. But um, I just love that such an exciting idea, the creation of new platforms, platforms and uh, the people that have maybe more of the funding or sources, resources help facilitate the artists and then the artists don't have to go to them, kind of like a flip. You know, like, and I love that, Gail, how are, because how yeah, are and I love that because that? actually, hmm? I love that because being a disabled woman and someone who advocates for people with disabilities, what you're saying also helps uh, because a lot of times, as a person with a disability, we can't. As an actress, like for instance, I was a wheelchair user and now I use mobility aids, but as I'm, you know, getting stronger. Sometimes, you know, I can't walk upstairs. So a lot of people that don't have the privilege to, to walk upstairs, they're cut out from, uh, from studios, from, from opportunities. So we need to level the playing field. So one of the things that the pandemic did bring about is Zoom. <laughs> and so now we can make the arts accessible for all. And again, just like Risha said, thank you so much for the ASL, thank you uh asl interpreters for doing such a wonderful job but i just I, i'm so sorry to interrupt you but you just made me realize how important um changing those those limitations and hopefully we'll have more of a hybrid um sort of uh when we go to events maybe they'll keep zoom maybe maybe we'll do things more hybrid hybrid meetings you know hybrid art so that it's accessible for all I just think the digital oh, yeah. platform. Sorry, mm -hmm. the digital platform has real. I mean, it it existed, but the way it's become vital during this time, I think, has made a huge difference. Because for some reason, once it's digital, you can present the artwork, and then someone can look at it and actually see how it could be used, right? And I, I mean, my mind is swirling with thoughts about all of the things you guys are talking about. It's all so relevant, like cross-pollinization between the different art forms. That's always been a dream of mine. And that's what I've been doing is working with, I'm a visual artist and a performance artist working with other types of artists. And like you said, um, Gail, breaking down a lot of those boundaries, demolishing them, because I think we've gotten to see through this, the incredible and epic things that can happen when we're all coming together and also cross-pollinization between levels of access which means yes, they, there are these coveted institutions that we all wanna be affiliated with and get down with, but do we really, or do we just want a platform to be able to share? And so the ways that everyone knows that and we can all start to work together and create a new future because there is no liberation without black liberation and there is no black liberation without art. That's always been the case. That's the case today. And I would just say that that's what I'm interested in birthing into the world and that's, who I come into this space as. I think that's liberating, which is our, which is our theme. Our theme, our theme. And just, I mean, just to like ex even pull that thread out even further, um, you create, you inspire, you drive, you investigate, you cause us to think through and revision, reimagine just, I guess, maybe traditional ways of being and doing in addition to platforms, like what else can institutions, what else can supporters, what else can recipients of, of, of the visionary do to help support you as you further create, provide space for you to create and build and inspire. Yeah, I'm excited. What I'm hearing is like these key words of like birthing 
-hmm. and the connection of that to the liberation. Mm -hmm. I just love it. It's so like organic and mm -hmm. you know, visceral and um, less up here, you know, like as uh, defined, right? Terms and definitions. Um, more about, you know, really um, how we feel and how we sense and how we know, right? Our intuitive knowledge is pretty strong, mm -hmm. you know, and um, getting rid of those hierarchies. But I love the idea of birthing liberation mm -hmm. and freedom for that matter. Or again, I, I still keep saying to myself, those two words now mean the same thing. They're kind of, or liminal or a crossover, you know, they're doubled up somehow. No, I agree. It, it needs to be more visceral, more feeling, not so much institution so that we can make, make it accessible for everyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I what I also found, oh, sorry. That was fascinating with the, the virtual and the Zooming. And, and I've worked with a lot of students this year too. And right, everyone's like, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And I was like, well, the number one thing we're gonna do is not do what, like try to put something that you would present on stage right? and just get rid of that model, right? And the minute you did that, Oh, it was so fun and so real. And so even having just like quiet or empty tile or everyone would like leave the Zoom screen or something intentionally, right? And like sort of play with the ways you're not supposed to use it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I found that was really, really cool. And, you know, um, I was disinterested in folks that kept trying to put the normal performative stuff into the Zoom, right? And pretend that it's a stage and pretend, you know, pretend all those things. <laughs> um, it was really fun throwing that out, just like get rid of it, you know? And I think, um, Risha, you were talking about how um, being in this, this challenge in these situations, you know, all of a sudden you find yourself doing more writing or doing more of something else. And again, for my experience, it was wonderful to see movers leaning, not that they were abandoning their bodies, but, you know, trusting and leaning in and into other um, zones and areas and, you know, dance movement people came out going, oh my God, I could do, I can paint something on my wall or I can write a play or I can uh, play the banjo now. I play the banjo now. It's hilarious, right? It was so exciting. Um, I'm kind of just riffing, but just this idea of like the, the the platforms and the models and turning them upside down, you know? Yeah. I, I'm thinking we can create more systemic change when we let go of all this confinement. Definitely. We just And we just, we're just, maybe we should just be. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to say some really boring things like we just need affordable housing in New York City and we need <laughs> universal health care and we need artists to talk about what is a living wage and for institutions to hear that when they put a call out for proposals. We need to get paid a living wage for what we do and not always feel so desperate like any tiny grant is like a gift from the heavens because oftentimes it's not enough really to sustain you so. That's I was fun. reading somewhere, sorry to interrupt, it's hard to segue, Catherine, <laughs> but where somebody in LA was trying to do that, like in a real more civic, you know, ed, ed groups and whatnot, is that, you know, uh, consult the artists and have uh, seating members on these decisions or boards or whatever of, excuse me, like, what do we do next? Like, we yeah. don't need the politicians. Like, no, we gotta, we gotta <laughs> speak out for what we need. And then that should be a required um, key core element of the people who have the power and the privilege, you know, to say, we're gonna have X many artists um, because y'all know that we are in a very important um, place and space that where, you know, mental health and this kind of whole idea of the re-entry, um, you know, I think of a lot of like, especially young kids, like what is gonna happen? You know, and everyone just thinks they're gonna shake the blanket out and everybody's gonna be good to go. <laughs> I don't think so, you know, and, I, and I, I'm not trying to be doom and gloom or anything, but it just feels like there's so many things that we could do now to make change and be recognized. And, you know, it's not just like, like oh, 
you know, pandemic over, right? And everyone's good now. Yeah. They need yeah, I'm, I'm seriously considering um, a, forming a coalition and I will definitely keep in touch with all of you the movement to, address, to address pay equity. Mm -hmm. And, and, and things like we're talking about uh, for people in the arts, um, equitable hiring, equitable education, all of those things that lead to that, leveling the playing field, period. Because people don't wanna talk about it, but you know, as Catherine said, it's something that people wanna shy away from, but we need to address it. We can't, I always say the pink elephant, but we cannot keep ignoring the pink elephant in the room, so. I'm here for that. <laughs> if you need help, <laughs> which you will, I will. I definitely will need help with that. The original then, formation of this was around a movement, and we are continuing to move and build movements. So, the next iteration um, of of that to come, and I think we're at time. I'm trying to keep us honest, y'all. Uh, <laughs> I think so. And I will, first, I want to acknowledge and thank you all for inspiring me um, and letting me just sit in and listen um, and, and be inspired by everything that you're thinking and doing and building and creating. And I'm here for the ride along with you and every, every move and iteration uh, that you make. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to continue to follow. Um, each of you and your practice and, and what you create and the movements that you build um, beyond this. Gail, like you said, the, the project doesn't end here. It's not over. It continues. Um, and I'm looking forward to continue to learn from you and all the rest of the commissioned artists. Um, and a big thank you to, again, the Met, Park Avenue Armory, to the ASL interpreters, to the tech folks production, Pamela, um, uh, for bringing us together and, and making sure that this comes off uh, well, so I will turn it over to Alexis now. Thank you, Aisha. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexis Gonzalez, and I am the Program Associate for Audience Development and Engagement at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a Latino male with short black hair, and I'm wearing a dark gray shirt and sitting in front of a beige backboard. I'm joining you from Los Angeles, California, the land of the Tongva and Gab Gabrieleño people and the Akja Chaman and Juanyeño nations who have lived and continue to live here. I also want to recognize and pay respect to the Tongva and Akja Chaman nations and their spiritual connection as the first stewards and caretakers of this land. Thank you to our brilliant and generous panelists also and to our audience for joining us today for the 100 Years 100 Women Conversation Series hosted by Park Avenue Armory and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. All of the panels will be archived in the 100 Years 100 Women website, which you can find at 100years100women.net. We hope to see you at our next conversation on June 25th and encourage you to visit our website to learn more about the 100 Years 100 Women Project, the commission artists and their work, and resources and related programming currently offered by our partner institutions. We will end with our sisters, daughters, and mothers, a Southeastern Woodlands contemporary women's honor song created and recorded by Martha Redbone. Thank you. Whoa, well, 